Hello again, my name is Tom Irvine, and I'm the instructor for this series of shock and vibration webinar units. And I again thank Dr. Curtis Larson and the NASA Engineering and Safety Center, NESC, for sponsoring this series of webinars. Today we're going to be discussing pyrotechnic shock response. Now in our previous webinar, we took a look at a seismic shock response and we spent some time analyzing the data from the El Centro earthquake. Well, everything we're going to do today is, is really the same as the previous unit, only in this case we have a pyrotechnic uh, shock event which is going to have a high amplitude, high frequency energy. So it's it, the only real difference between the uh, previous unit and this one is the, uh, the transposition of the energy uh, from, from the low frequencies to the higher frequencies as we go from seismic to pyrotechnic. But then there's a few other uh, things we're going to be discussing about pyrotechnic shock as well. Okay. So here's a stage separation ground test. And this is a series of uh, launch vehicle uh, cylindrical shells uh, stacked one on top of another. And the separation device is linear shape charge. So this was a ground test, and the idea was to set off this charge and to measure the resulting acceleration at various uh, stations where avionics uh, components might be mounted. And one of the interesting things about this is obviously you see the smoke and the fire. Well, if, if this were to occur in the, the near vacuum uh, conditions of space that the smoke and fire would be absent. Uh, instead, you'd, you'd maybe see just a flash of a plasma jet. But one of the important points here is that this is really uh, a very severe, violent event. And as the charge goes off and, and, and the ring is, the connecting ring is strained and then fractures all in, you know, less than a millisecond, really. Uh, that induces a tremendous amount of uh, strain energy that gets suddenly released, and there is a very severe high frequency, high amplitude mechanical shock energy that's generated, and that energy propagates through materials and joints to various avionics mounting locations. There's also some other effects. There's the shrapnel, and you've, most likely you've heard of uh, electromagnetic interference. Well, this type of event produces an electromagnetic pulse, which is a, a transient uh, version of uh, EMI. And one of the points that I'd like to make, and I'll probably make it a couple more times, is that it's really best to not mount avionics components near a separation plane. We, we want those components to be as, as, as far away as, as possible from mm -hmm. that separation plane. Okay, so we've talked about linear shape charge. Here's another uh, device. This is uh, was used on the space shuttle program for the uh, solid rocket boosters, and these are called frangible nuts. A and the idea was when the uh, space shuttle system was uh, prior to launch, when it was attached to the launch pad, um, there were these hold down uh, posts and studs and, and, and nuts, and, and the idea was to keep the the, the space shuttle system stationary, particularly uh, in the event that some high winds would come about or, or, or maybe even a hurricane uh, would occur. So in this diagram here, this kind of purple color, that's the frangible nut. And then you can see the entire hold down uh, post assembly there. So, so these nuts had uh, charges embedded uh, on either side. And just prior to launch, uh, at some point during the countdown process, the explosive charge would be initiated and, and these frangible nuts would be uh, uh, separated. Now, frangible is just a fancy word that means breakable or something that can be broken. So that's another uh, type of device. And, and actually there, there are, or I should say were, avionics components mounted in the aft skirt of these solid rocket boosters, as well as uh, TVC components like uh, thrust vector control uh, components. 
and, and all of those components, those avionics and TVC components, had to withstand the shock event. Now here's a Delta IV heavy launch, and we have a, a video, and this video clip footage is really interesting because it focuses on the on the separation events. Ten, nine, nine eight, eight, seven, seven, seven start. Six, six, five, five four, three, two, two one, one, zero, plus one. Lift off. Lift two, off. Two, the three, flight of the double four, four heavy rocket. Five, six, seven, seven, eight, 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 Okay, partial thrust on level on all vehicles. Chamber pressure is dropping on the port and starboard as expected. And we can see a positive indication of a successful strap-on separation. Okay, partial thrust level has been commanded into the core vehicle as we prepare for staging. Okay, booster solid rocket motor ignition has been passed. SR K12 step. Next deploy indicator email is unlocked. Igniter. We have had stage separation and the second stage is powered up. Okay, we have fairing. We have successful fairing separation. Running on the second stage. Okay, that was the uh, uh, video footage from the Delta IV he heavy launch. And each of those events you saw had some type of a pyrotechnic device um, that was causing that event to occur. And we'll talk more about those um, uh, coming up in a future uh, slide. Okay. Now, when we talk about shock, especially in the case of launch vehicles, we, we tend to uh, divide the, the shock up into into fields or zones, and, and these are not exact uh, definitions. Uh, these, these are just sort of um, kind of some qualitative uh, general descriptions. So near the source device, near the separation plane, or it could be a point source, we have what we call the near field shock. And the near field shock is dominated by high frequency, high amplitude wave motion. And preferably, hopefully, there are no avionics mounted in the near field. Then the third bullet down, we have the, the far field. And as that shock energy propagates from the near field to the far field, the higher frequency energy tends to be uh, somewhat attenuated so that only low frequency energy remains. And in the far field, the response tends to be dominated by the structural modes. Now there's also a midfield region uh, which is composed of both wave motion and structural modes. And, and of course, uh, the way these fields uh, are set up, it depends on the, the type of separation device, whether it's a point source or whether it's uh, li like the separation of two connected cylindrical modules, so there's a separation plane. And there's all, all sorts of structural details that are, are going to determine how these fields set up. But I'm just going to throw out some rough numbers here. Uh, the near field is probably uh, from the source, maybe uh, to a couple of feet, maybe I'll just say five feet. And, and then the midfield might be the region five to ten feet. And then the far field would be ten feet and further. Now, <laughs> like the saying goes, your mileage may vary uh, depending on a whole plethora of, uh, of, of factors. Um, 
One of the things also that's kind of interesting about this is that in many cases we do have avionics mounted in the far field. And as we, as we measure the data for the separation test or, or, the, or the flight accelerometer data, we, we get the SRS data and we tend to draw a conservative envelope around that. And then we say, well, we only have one piece of data, so there's statistical uncertainty. So then we might add 3 dB or 4.5 dB or 6 dB uh, to account for flight-to-flight uh, -flight variation or spatial variation or, or, or whatever. And then we might add another 6 dB on top of that uh, to get a full qualification level. Then if it's a flight termination component uh, or range safety component, might have to add a couple extra dB on. So by the time we've added all this margin onto, onto these measured levels, and then we go into the test lab to test our component, so we have this component mount in the far field, but there's so much margin, we have to do a near field test in the lab. And so we take this avionics box or whatever it might be, attach it to a plate, and on the back side of that plate we wrap around some uh, detonation cord. And, 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 that, and that's something that we really need to give a lot more thought to is uh, uh, the, the way we, we are very overly conservative in many cases when we test these components. Have to, I mean, should have had that on full screen. And what we're concerned about in particular is electronic circuit boards. Now, on circuit boards, there might be some sensitive piece parts like these crystal oscillators shown here. And oscillators can, can shatter. And, and another thing that can happen is, is components, especially if we have something large like a DC to DC converter, those components can actually detach during the circuit board as a result of the shock response. So we're concerned, among other things, about the failure of solder joints or the lead wires. And, and, and this is a big concern for shock testing. And of course, we're also concerned about uh, pneumatic components and thrust vector control components and um, other types of components as well. In fact, there, there are so many different types of charges on a launch vehicle that uh, some of those charges have to withstand shock events from, from uh, other charges as well. So one of the sensible things to do to mitigate the effects of shock is to take the avionics component and mount it via isolators. So this is a, an image that I've shown you before a couple, two or three times. And this was from a Scud B missile, which was put on public display in Huntsville, Alabama. And there's these black grommets or isolator bushings made out of uh, some sort of rubber or thermoplastic or elastomeric material. And these, uh, what these do is they break the metal-to-metal -metal contact between the box and its mounting bracket. And some people would refer to these as dampers or dampeners. And it's true they do provide damping, which is beneficial. But the even more important effect is that they act like a soft spring to lower the natural frequency of the component. Now, in my mind, the ideal avionics component is one that's mounted externally with these soft isolators. And then, and, and then the circuit board would be have some kind of a encapsulation or thick conformal coat with all the components you know, potted or, or, or staked down with some type of uh, epoxy type of, of uh, compound. And, and, that, and that's all well and good from a mechanical point of view, but uh, the electrical engineers uh, don't really like that because if they have to go and change out a piece part, that means they have to scrape away all that thick conformal coat or whatever. But, but it is a good engineering practice to you know, have different types of staking and, and potting and thick conformal coats. Uh, in, in order to help uh, secure those components to the circuit board, particularly uh, with respect to uh, shock events. And then externally, <laughs> isolate the box as well for another um, level of uh, protection. Now here's another avionics components. And, and, and by the way, it's very difficult to find 
to do a Google search on images and find isolated avionics components because it's all they're all classified or for official use only or uh, some sort of other uh, type of restriction. But, but this one is publicly available and it's from the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory and it's for a Mars Science Laboratory and this is a sensor electronics uh, avionics box and it's mounted in this case on these wire rope isolators. Now wire rope isolators have some advantages and disadvantages relative to say just a rubber or thermoplastic isolator. And, and that is that these wire rope isolators can usually take up more relative displacement. And another thing to consider is uh, temperature sensitivity. So if we have a rubber compound, for example, as the temperature becomes colder, that uh, the stiffness, uh, the isolators stiffen up and become more harder. And, and that sort of can uh, diminish their ability to provide isolation. Well, wire rope isolators are much more stable with temperature. So that's another reason for using them. But there are some you know, disadvantages, one being that uh, they're, they're very nonlinear. The, the stiffness, say, say if we're looking at this box and, and the downward or compression axis, uh, this, the stiffness would be, would be different than if, these, uh, if the box were moving upward and these uh, springs were being stretched. These, or these, I mean, these wire rope isolators are being stretched. So there's some concerns with nonlinearity, and uh, it, it takes more volume uh, to incorporate the wire rope isolators as well. And, and one of the points I'd like to make is whether you're going to use wire rope isolators or some elastomeric grommets or bushings is do not take the vendor uh, catalog data at face value. You really need to go and do your own test on your own component. Uh, you can use a mass simulator, and, and, and you need to do that to check the stiffness, to check the linearity, uh, to check the damping. And you may want to, uh, say, mount this box on a shaker table and, and put some kind of uh, uh, external uh, box over it uh, that would be like, like a thermal chamber type of effect, so you could uh, test these under hot and cold temperatures. And, 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 and that's something to do if your isolators are going to have to uh, withstand those extremes. That, that's a good engineering practice. So, in other words, do your own uh, due diligence. And uh, there's a saying, I guess, attributed to Pro President Ronald Reagan is trust but verify. And when it comes to isolators, the emphasis is on verification rather than just trusting the vendor literature. Okay, we, we saw the video footage earlier from the uh, the, the Delta IV Heavy and this slide, I guess, uh, is, is a bit out of order, but let's, let's go ahead and talk about it anyways. So with launch vehicles, we can have separation events. These can be uh, the separation and jettison of the strap-on boosters, stage separation events, fairing separation events. The, the, the fairing is, is a clamshell type structure that, uh, uh, in, in which the payload is enclosed. Uh, there's also the, the payload has its own separation event. Uh, Typically, that would be a clamp band or a V band with, with some uh, bolt cutters. And there's some other types as well. Uh, ignition events, uh, particularly for a solid rocket motor, it can have a fairly uh, severe ignition event. So these are some of the type of events we have to concern ourselves with. There's some other type of devices as well. Uh, there would be like point source devices, a uh, pyro, pyro valve or pyrotechnic valve uh, would be one example. And there's little bolt cutters and miscellaneous uh, uh, type of parts that uh, are pyrotechnic as well. And here's another type of uh, a separation device that's uh, fairly common. In fact, I think this was used uh, for the uh, payload fairing uh, separation device in that uh, Delta IV footage that we looked at earlier. And it's called a frangible joint. And what it is is there's a mild detonating fuse. And it is uh, mounted inside an explosive confinement tube. So, and then there's some miscellaneous things like initiation manifolds and attachment hardware. Uh, 
Well, this tube, the, the charge inside the tube is initiated or set off. Then the pressure from that uh, detonating fuse causes the tube to expand radially outward. And along this range ring, there's, there's two no notches on either side. And, and the notches, well, let me back up. That, that tube is, is contained in a hollow space inside this ring. And then when, when, when the tube expands radially outward, then the ring fails at, uh, the, there's a fracture at the notch, both the inside notch and the, then the outer uh, circumference notch as well. And these are, tend to be favored over um, linear shape charge in that there's less shrapnel. Uh, the, sh the, the shock event, the, the mechanical shock, is somewhat lower than linear shape charge. Um, but uh, when we start looking at things like uh, body bending loads and bending at these joints and, this, and stresses, uh, I believe that the linear shape charge type joint uh, can withstand more stress than can a frangible joint. So there are some limitations to how frangible joints can be used, uh, but, but they're uh, very typically used in, for say, a payload fairing uh, separation event. And again, one of several reasons for that is that there is uh, much, much less shrapnel than a linear shape charge. OK, now when we get these devices, we like to, to make reference tables. And, and this reference table here is it, it is for reference only. And this is a frangible joint, 26.25 uh, grain per foot. It's the source shock. So you can see SRS, Q is equal to 10. We have the natural frequency in hertz and the peak acceleration in G. And we've got uh, these three breakpoints or coordinate points. And these source shocks are useful for design and test purposes. Well, hopefully we do, we do not have any avionics mounted anywhere close to this um, source plane. But what happens is, let, let's say there's an avionics component mounted uh, so many inches away from this uh, source. And so the shock energy has to propagate through joints and material to get to the actual component mounting location. So we have some empirical relationships for doing that propagation analysis to de determine the maximum predicted uh, environment shock at the actual component mounting location. And in a, hopefully in a future webinar, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and do some uh, propagation analysis uh, to teach you how to do that. Uh, but anyways, as we're starting off, it's good to, to have these source shock devices as a reference. And, and again, this is very much a situation where your mileage may vary. So uh, as useful as these levels might be, you, re you really need to go and perform your own ground separation test. Uh, because the source shock, as well as the propagation, is highly dependent on structural details. OK, one of the things we <clears throat> excuse me, need to do sometimes is uh, interpolate. Now, we, we've already done some interpolation, I think, uh, in, a, in a previous webinar. So let's say, even though it would be a really bad idea, there is an avionics component mounted near the source, and it has a 600 hertz natural frequency with a Q value of 10, and that's equivalent to 5% damping. What would, what would its uh, uh, shock response be? Of course, we're assuming it's a, also it's a single degree of freedom system. So let's see what vibration data is up to this week. OK, MATLAB's a little bit slow, but finally came up. Uh, the GUI package is 5.9 this week and rising. So if we go uh, DB calculations for log log plots, let me uh, kind of park this off to the side so I can. So this is a miscell miscellaneous mm -hmm. analysis. And in this case, our coordinate is going to be at separate frequencies. So we've got a shock response spectrum G. And we're going to find a new coordinate given two coordinates. So I'm going to type in these coordinate points. 
or you could call them breakpoints if you like. And our new coordinate is going to be at 600 hertz. We're assuming that's the natural frequency of our avionics component. So as we calculate, we find that at 600 hertz, we have 1139 G. So that's that intermediate point between the first uh, pair of coordinates there. And that can be useful for uh, design purposes. Of course, uh, if, if this component is, is to be mounted near the separation plane, it would be much better to isolate it so it had a lower natural frequency, so it would have a lower peak acceleration response level. We'll talk more about that in upcoming slides. Okay, a few other things here. So we just ran the dB octave uh, utility there, and we did our interpolation at 600 hertz. Now note that the slope here for this uh, source shock, uh, the ramp is 8.18 dB per octave. So keep that number in the back of your mind. Now most, the most common format for an SRS specification for pyrotechnic shock is a ramp and a plateau. And probably, oh, 80 to 85% of SRS specs are, are that way, just two straight line segments on log-log paper, ramp, plateau. Now, having said that, uh, sometimes people get uh, maybe a little carried away with trying to finally tailor these uh, specifications. And if you start looking at specs, you'll see some that have four or five or six or even seven coordinate points. But the basic one uh, just has three coordinates with a, a ramp and a plateau. Okay, now here's, we're going to talk about these ramps or these slopes. So here's an SRS, and along the y-axis we have peak acceleration in G. Along the x-axis we have natural frequency in hertz. And any time we have an SRS, I'm always telling you, you need to put the Q value. Well, in this case, what I'm going to show you holds for all Q values. So that's why I put all Q values. Now, if that ramp is has a slope of 60 B per octave, then that's a special case. It's called a constant velocity line. And it's very easy to remember what 60 B per octave is. So think about rise and run. If the run is a one decade increase along the natural frequency, and the rise is also a one decade increase along the peak acceleration, then that is 60 B per octave. So you can see this is sort of a diagonal line that connects opposite corners of this box. Now here's another special case. It's 12 dB per octave. It's constant displacement. So for the case of constant displacement, if the frequency goes up by one order of magnitude and the peak acceleration goes up by two order of magnitudes, well, that's a 12 dB per octave ramp. Now, typically for pyrotechnic shock events, we expect the ramp to be between 6 to 12 dB per octave. And in that previous uh, reference spec example, it was uh, 8.18 dB per octave. Now, ha having said this, of course, it depends on what type of a field we're looking at. And the statements I just made are, would be more relevant to say, in the case of measured data, to a near-field shock. And if we're looking at uh, more of a far-field shock with structural modes, what we'll find is that there's a whole series of peaks and dips. But, but still, even for that uh, far-field or even a mid-field shock, we expect the overall trend to be somewhere between 12 dB and 6 dB per octave. That's what we expect the overall trend to be. Um, having said that, I'm sure there are exceptions out there, but that's just sort of a, a, a rule of thumb or guideline. So let's talk about uh, some structural responses here. So we have our single degree of freedom system that we've looked at so many times before. We have our mass M, and from Hooke's Law we have the stiffness K. We've got the dash pod or damper C, viscous damping coefficient. 
Y double dot, that's the base acceleration input. X double dot, absolute acceleration response. And we know we can uh, draw a free body diagram and to characterize the, the forces acting on the mass. Then we can take Newton's law, sum the forces on the mass, derive the governing equation of motion. And for the case of uh, an arbitrary base input, such as a uh, El Centro earthquake shock or a stage separation pyrotechnic shock, um, we have to use a convolution integral, or you might say a Duhamel's integral, to solve that problem. Well, those integrals are, are it's really two different names for the same thing. That integral is very inefficient to solve in terms of a software program. So instead we use the David O. Smallwood ramp invariant digital recursive filtering relationship, which we've already covered several times in this uh, series of webinar units. I think maybe the first time we started using it, or one of the first times, was when we uh, synthesized some white noise, and we said, well, how would this uh, white noise, if it were applied as a base input, how, what would the response of a mass be? So once again, here we have x double dot sub i, that's the absolute acceleration of the mass at time step i, and it's equal to this coefficient times the response acceleration one time step ago, minus this coefficient times the acceleration two time steps ago. And these first two terms here are the recursive terms. So you could think about this as being a filter because after all this is a filtering relationship. And these first two terms on the right hand side of the equal sign are the feedback loop. Then we have each of three coefficients here times a base acceleration one time step ago plus a base acceleration excuse me, this is the base acceleration at the current time step i, then this is the base acceleration one time step ago, and then this is the base acceleration two time steps ago. And this is the, uh, d again, the David O. Smallwood ramp invariant digital recursive filtering relationship, and it's uh, reasonably easy uh, to write a, a computer program or MATLAB script to implement this, and it is fast and it is accurate. So, we make good use of this. Uh, just a couple of notes. Now, this, these several bullets here are really kind of a review uh, from things we already covered in our webinar 10. We talk, we've talked about aliasing and sample rates and Nyquist frequencies. And we did that in Unit 10. And we're actually going to talk about it more again in an upcoming webinar. But uh, just for today, we have this slide here. And as we measure pyrotechnic shock energy, the sample rate should be at least 10 times greater than the maximum SRS frequency. So typically for an SRS, we'd go up to 10 kilohertz, so our sample rate should be at least 100 kilohertz. And that's based on rule of thumb that at least 10 points are needed to represent one period of a sine function in the time domain. So think of the highest uh, frequency component and think about one, one cycle or one period of that component. We need at least 10 points to, to reasonably accurately characterize that. And that's how come we have this 10 times rule here. And it's also important, and I'll say vital, that we have an analog anti-aliasing filter. Uh, because we don't know what the highest energy component will be. Uh, we Maybe we're only interested up to 10 kilohertz, but particularly if this is a near-field shock, there could be shock energy up to 100 kilohertz or even higher. So we need an analog anti-aliasing filter, and its cutoff frequency should be below the Nyquist frequency. And if you go back uh, to webinar 10, you can review uh, some guidelines uh, for further details and guidelines as to what type of characteristics that uh, that low-pass filter should have. Uh, but, but for now, just remember that that cutoff frequency has to be below the Nyquist frequency. So back to this previous example, we, we want to analyze up to 10 kilohertz. Our sample rate should be, let's say our sample rate is exactly 100 kilohertz. 
Well, then the uh, Nyquist frequency would be 50 kilohertz. So the anti-aliasing cutoff frequency should be somewhere between 10 kilohertz and 50 kilohertz, which again, 50 kilohertz is the Nyquist frequency. And again, see uh, webinar 10 for further details. Okay, this is the point in our course where we actually get to look at some measured pyrotechnic shock data. And in everything we're doing with the MATLAB uh, demonstrations I'm showing you, please repeat these exercises as homework. And this, this is actually a very rare piece of data uh, because it is a shock event, uh, a re-entry vehicle separation event. And this was an unmanned suborbital vehicle. And it's very rare that we have the allotted sample rate or frequency bandwidth to, to accurately measure pyro shock, near field pyrotechnic shock from a launch vehicle in flight. And, and the reason is, is that there are so many other things competing for that frequency bandwidth. There are also strain gauges and thermal couples and pressure gauges and various voltage sensors and current sensors. There, there, there may be, uh, for example, there may be brake wires, for example, that uh, uh, have voltage signals that, that need to be monitored. And, and, and I'm, I'm probably uh, uh, leaving out a few things. Uh, just, just the inertia navigation systems alone uh, have all sorts of different channels of data that they're passing down. And so there's only so much bandwidth available for, for all these sensors. <laughs> and so it's very rare that we can allocate sufficient bandwidth to uh, accurately sample a pyrotechnic event. But this is one case where we were able to do so. Oh, I forgot to, <laughs> I should have also mentioned that in addition to shock accelerometers, we might have vibration accelerometers uh, for, for further taking up bandwidth. And in, in many cases, a decision is made to uh, uh, forego the, 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 the separation shock measurement in order that accurate vibration measurements uh, can be made, which can be done at lower sample rates. So in many cases, we're just limited to the, uh, the ground test in, in order to determine what these uh, uh, shock levels are going to be. But this is flight accelerometer data, and we're going to take a look at this. And another thing to notice is that this is going up to uh, plus and minus 5,000 Gs. Well, in the case of the El Centro earthquake, that was uh, within plus and minus four tenths of a G. And the difference is, in this case, well, there's several differences. The energy is transposed up to much higher frequencies over much shorter duration. And, and obviously, the, the earthquake is, uh, is fundamentally different in that it affected a widespread area, whereas this is just a, uh, a separation event for a a uh, fairly small diameter launch vehicle that was maybe uh, three or four feet in diameter. But let's go ahead and uh, do some uh, calculations. Let's go back to our MATLAB. And let's say we have an avionics component. It has a natural frequency of 700 hertz. It has a Q is equal to 10. And how is it going to respond to the shock event? Now, hopefully, uh, there is no avionics component mounted near this uh, separation event, but uh, I in many cases, despite that warning, uh, there are other factors that uh, indeed, in indeed lead to avionics being mounted in near field in adjacent to uh, a separation device. So let's go to vibration data. We're going to run a script we've run it before. So we have a time history input, and we have single degree of freedom response to base input. And we're going to call up an external ASCII file. It's going to have two columns, time in seconds and acceleration in G. Let's call that up. So this is going to be, in other words, our input file is time in seconds, and it's the base acceleration. And we're modeling our avionics as a single degree of freedom system. English units, 700 hertz natural frequency. Q is equal to 10. Let's calculate the response. Get a couple of plots that come up. Um, 
we have uh, some descriptive statistics in the results box. And we can see that if we take the absolute value, we've got, uh, for the response, we have about 661 Gs. And for the relative displacement, we have about 13 thousandths of an inch. So let's look at some plots here. On the left side, we have the base input acceleration, acceleration in G versus time in seconds. This is the measured flight accelerometer data. And on the right side, we have the response at 700 hertz. And these two plots, they have the tame, same time scale, but the y-axis has different maximum and minimums for each of the two. So with our base input, we have about plus or minus 5,000 G. And for this response, uh, this uh, point here is about minus 661 Gs. So if we, as we qualitatively look at this, we can say, well, it looks like some of that high frequency energy is propagating through, although it is attenuated. And, and, th and then you can see that uh, the high frequency energy uh, it rapidly damps out. And what we have remaining is the reverberation that is occurring at the 700 hertz natural frequency. So that's the characteristic of the response. Maybe I'll zoom in on it and you can see, yeah, we get a whole series of high frequency peaks. Then those uh, d dissipate or damp out. And then we're left with the uh, 700 hertz. I call it reverberation. That's kind of borrowing a term from the acoustics world. Then here is the corresponding relative displacement in inches versus time in seconds. And we get about 13 thousandths of an inch peak relative displacement. So as far as the circuit board, let's say this component has a circuit board. These are the types of numbers we'd be concerned with for our circuit board. It's the uh, acceleration response and the relative displacement response. L later on, we're going to be uh, taking a look at more detail in terms of uh, circuit board response and some of the things that uh, uh, Professor Steinberg uh, came up with in terms of uh, empirical relationships. And we'll take, we'll take a look at that and uh, we'll be focusing more on the relative displacement when we get to that point. Let's see, so I think that uh, covers us for the uh, single degree of freedom response there. Now, sometimes we know what the natural frequency of our component is. In that case, then we, we can go ahead and run this function, the single degree of freedom response, the base input. This is for a known natural frequency and a known Q value. Well, sometimes we do not know what our natural frequency is. Or we have upper and lower estimates what the bounds of that natural frequency will be. Or sometimes we might say, well, we have an array or, or several different avionics mounted uh, in, in this zone. So we, we need to come up with a shock response spectrum level uh, that can cover all those different cases. So for, for those uh, types of scenarios, we calculate a shock response spectrum. Now, everything we're doing so far, we really did the same thing for the El Centro earthquake only now the energy is transposed to higher frequencies for the case of pyrotechnic shock. So we're going to call in our, I'll just back up here. So this script calculates the shock response spectrum of a single degree of freedom system subjected to a base excitation. The input array must have two columns, time in seconds and acceleration. So let's call up that uh, RV separation dot dat, which that data file is available on my blog. We'll do the English units, and now typically with the shock response spectrum, we start at 100 hertz and go up to 10,000. I'm actually going to go down to 10 uh, for the, in this case. Now the reason we start 100 is that there's two reasons that that's typical, even though I'm only starting at 10 today. Um, it is very difficult for sensors, accelerometers, to accurately measure high amplitude, high frequency energy while simultaneously measuring low amplitude, low frequency energy. It's really asking too much of our sensors. 
So, so in many cases, we'll say, well, below 100 hertz, uh, we, we can't get uh, an, an accurate uh, measurement of the data anyway, so we're just going to ignore that. And that type of approach can be further justified if we say, well, the natural frequencies of all the relevant uh, or affected components are above 100 hertz anyways, which for circuit boards would often be the case because they would have oh, a fundamental frequency of a circuit board uh, would probably be no lower than 200 hertz and could be as high as 800 hertz. Well, another challenge we run up against is that in, in terms of pyrotechnic shock, the acceleration time history can have a spurious baseline shift or some spurious low frequency trend or there's something else called saturation. Now, we're going to be talking more about saturation and these sorts of uh, spurious trends in an upcoming webinar unit, probably the next one. And there's ways we can go and do some data editing and correct for those. But uh, in some cases, we just sort of throw up our hands and say, well, we just can't measure <laughs> below 100 hertz very accurately anyways. So it's just our SRS at 100. And that's what we usually do for pyrotechnic shock, although I'm going to make an exception and start at 10 hertz for this plot. Okay, it takes a moment to calculate, get a whole bunch of plots popping up there. So let's just work through these. Okay, you've seen this one before, figure one. Figure one. This is the measured flight accelerometer data, so it's the base input acceleration time history. Acceleration G versus time in seconds. And here's the corresponding shock response spectrum, acceleration SRS. I've uh, duly noted Q is equal to 10, which is equivalent to 5% damping. Got uh, peak acceleration G versus natural frequency in hertz. And it's very important to include that adjective, natural. <laughs> because if we just said, oh, frequency in hertz, then someone might mistake this for a Fourier transform. Then we have our positive and negative curves. Obviously, the negative is the absolute value of the negative. And let's just take a kind of a look at a couple points here. If we look at this uh, peak here, oops. Well, OK, let's go ahead and do this. OK, at about uh, 2,400 hertz, we have over 20,000 Gs. That's the absolute acceleration response Gs assuming that we have a natural frequency of 2,000 hertz. And I want to see if I can do a reset view here. OK. So if you were to go, if you were measuring this data, either for, maybe it was a ground test, although in this case it was flight data, or, or whatever, whichever, and you go to the electrical engineers, or the program managers, and you say, oh, the component has to withstand 20,000 Gs. Well, that, that other person you're talking to might just freak out and, and uh, be very upset over that, <laughs> and rightfully so. <laughs> because in terms of electronic components and many other avionics, there's no way they could withstand 20,000 G. But what this pair of curves are really telling us is that we need to pick off the peak Gs from our natural frequency. So if we set our natural frequency down Okay, at, uh, well, let's, let's go back to the point we did for our hypothetical case. Let's see, for our hypothetical case, we said, uh, okay, we had a 700 hertz component. Now, I don't have an exact uh, 700 points al along these uh, two curves here, so I'm just going to get as close as I can. So that's about 700 hertz. And remember we said, oh, 700 hertz, 661 Gs. Well, that's, that's roughly corresponding to this point. So again, to serve as a review, what the SRS calculation does is it goes for a full family of natural frequencies, in each case calculating the time domain response, and then and this only retaining the peak positive and peak negative for each response of each oscillator, hypothetical oscillator, and those get plotted up as the SRS curves. So in other words, the SRS calculation is doing a lot of bookkeeping for us. OK, so if our natural frequency is 700 hertz, no, we're not going to have a 20,000 G response. Rather, we're going to have, uh, yeah, if I round up, a 700 G response. Well, the idea of shock isolation, though, is to come 
down further. So we just want to slide down this ramp. And if we're mounting our avionics box via shock isolators, we might want to have, for example, a 35 hertz natural frequency. And if we do that, we only have a 6G, 6G response. And it's, it's, it's much more likely, obviously, that the circuit board could withstand 6Gs than it could 20,000 Gs. So, so, so this is why we like to mount our components via isolator bushings or wire rope isolators. Now, I'm kind of oversimplifying a bit because there would also be some additional benefit because uh, I'm assuming 5% damping here. And if we, if we carefully select our isolators, we might get 8% damping or 10% damping. So it also has some advantage from damping as well. But the biggest benefit, the most significant benefit to using the isolators is that they're equivalent to soft springs and we reduce our natural frequency. So that's just a few points on the acceleration SRS. And there's also a couple other plots we have here, which uh, you should remember these formats from El Centro Earthquake. We have our relative displacement SRS. So it's very important, especially if we're going to have like isolator mounts, to see if those mounts can withstand the expected relative displacement. And in many cases, as we go down this ramp, the relative deflection will rise. Well, in this case, it tends to be more of stable, both for positive and negative, uh, whereas the peak relative displacement occurs at about uh, 2,000 hertz. But in, in other cases, we would see that the relative displacement would be rising as natural frequency is reduced. So just keep that in mind, especially for uh, if your design is going to include isolators. And then Howard Gaberson and Vesta Bateman and some others have told us, oh, oops, I meant to refer to this plot, is that uh, we really need to focus on pseudo velocity because dynamic stress is directly proportional to pseudo velocity. And pseudo velocity is the, is, the, is the best of the three metrics in order to judge the severity of a shock. And in this case, uh, the pseudo velocity also has a, a ramp. Now, my own uh, take on this is each of these three can be important. <laughs> so what we should do is look at what Howard Gaberson would call a four-coordinate plot. And sometimes I call it that, but more often I would call it a tripartite plot. Either way, it doesn't matter what you call it. So this is uh, fundamentally, this is going to be a pseudo-velocity shock response spectrum. Q is equal to 10, so we have velocity inches per second natural frequency in hertz. And, and just to review, pseudo velocity is equal to the relative displacement shock response spectrum, where we've taken the relative displacement shock response spectrum and we've multiplied it by omega sub n at each of its natural frequencies. And omega sub n is equal to 2 pi times the natural frequency in hertz. So here's our pseudo velocity, and we're getting up to about 500 inches per second. That is severe. And with pseudo velocity, uh, the guideline is to judge it by its highest point. And if we look at the downward sloping lines, we can pick off what the acceleration is. So at uh, near 2,000 hertz, we have about 20,000 g response. And then if we turn our head uh, 90 degrees the other way, then we have our relative displacement uh, values in inches. So each of those three response metrics could and really should be of interest to us in terms of our isolator design or, or just even if it's a hard-mounted avionics, understanding what its response will be. OK, let's see what else we have here. Let's, uh, yeah, let's see. OK. Let's move on to some other slides here. So in, this, in, the, in the slides here, uh, we, we just ha really have those same plots that I just showed you. OK, here was the case where we put in that 700 hertz natural frequency. Q is equal to 10. And here was the response at the specific natural frequency of 700 hertz in the time domain. <clears throat> 
Then the corresponding relative displacement, again in the time domain. Then we took an SRS of that same time history from 10 to 10,000 hertz. Now this was its acceleration level uh, in, in Gs and the SRS acceleration, peak G versus natural frequency in hertz. And as we look at the slopes here, it's, it's going to be roughly about 6 dB per octave. So this is roughly a constant velocity line. Oh, that reminded me of something I meant to tell you earlier. Let me go back. I've seen many people do this. They have an SRS spec. It has a ramp and a plateau. And people get into a habit of saying, oh, that ramp is the constant velocity line. Well, that's true, only true if it's a 6 dB per octave <laughs> slope. So please keep that in mind. And, and sometimes we have to, to gently correct other people that uh, misunderstand these plots. OK, back to the plots here. So we, uh, we've already seen that one. So this is our acceleration uh, SRS. And of course, we did the one case uh, manually where we looked at the 700 hertz, and it was uh, about 660 Gs. Then the corresponding pseudo velocity, uh, where we were getting up to 500 inches per second, which is very severe. Which is another way of saying, please don't mount your avionics close to that source plane. The corresponding relative displacement, inches versus natural frequency in hertz. Then we took a look at the four coordinate plot or tripartite plot. And let's see here, what do we want to take a look? Okay, yeah, we, 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 we took a look at that uh, already. Okay, f there, there's a rule of thumb uh, for electronic equipment. And that is that, and this is in mil standard 810E, and I, I realize mil standard 810 is up to, to rev G or maybe rev H by now, but let's, let's go back to 810E. And it states the shock response spectrum is considered severe only if one of its components exceeds the level. And, and here's the threshold. We have a, a 0 0.8 Gs per hertz times natural frequency in hertz. So the severity threshold, as an example, would be if we had a natural frequency of 100 hertz, it would be 80 Gs. Or if we had 1,000 hertz, it would be 800 Gs. Or 10,000 hertz, 8,000 Gs. And of course, we could do that uh, same calculation for intermediate points as well. And what this rule ac actually works out to be is a velocity criterion. And Milstad 810E states, in fact, that this rule is based on unpublished observations that military quality equipment does not tend to exhibit shock failures below a shock response spectrum velocity of 100 inches per second, which is 254 centimeters per second. Well, actually, there's a, a 60 dB safety margin uh, in, involved because this rule up here actually corresponds to 50 inches per second. And in some cases, uh, let's say there's an avionics component and the, the qualification shock level is less than 50 inches per second. Uh, in, a, in some cases, a decision will be made to forego or skip the shock test because we'll say it's a benign shock. Well, that, that, you kind of got to be careful with that. It takes some engineering judgment. And there are exceptions, obviously. Uh, for example, spacecraft uh, components. Uh, need need to be uh, shock tested regardless uh, what what that uh, peak velocity from that SRS would actually be. So kind of be careful with that, but also be aware that that uh, that rule is out there. And that includes the uh, presentation today. We're going to be talking more about shock response spectrum in upcoming units, and among other things, we're going to. Uh, revisit the uh, I, the concern about aliasing with shock data. We also need to learn how to edit uh, shock data, for example, if we need to remove some saturation effects. 
We're going to be taking shock response spectra and synthesizing time histories to satisfy those and then using those time histories as base input into analytical modules, analytical models, and maybe a few other things as well. So I hope you've enjoyed this uh, webinar and uh, please email me if you have questions and we'll talk to you later. So thank you and goodbye.